I don't have to introduce Ron Blue. Ron Blue um, needs really no introduction. I always like to say that um, Ron Blue, at a very precipitous point in my wife and I's young marriage with a baby, we had a Toyota Camry, which was perfectly fine for one car seat. And then as things go, there was another car seat. And then as things happened to go, there was another car seat. So we knew that the Toyota Camry was no longer sufficient. Well, we went car shopping. We became prey to the salesmen who sell cars. And my wife had no clue on what we were doing. We were being sold a big package of goods. And we were two inches away from signing. And then one night, my wife said to me, do you think we can afford this car? And I said to my wife, well, the salesman said we can afford this car. <laughs> and this was the early days, believe me, of the internet, circa 1990 something, early 90s. And I'll never forget, I put down Christian Advice Financial. Ron Blue came up. And my wife and I learned about what a budget is meant to do and not do. And we went back with a lot of informed power and willpower. And we actually negotiated what we needed instead of what we wanted. So Ron, thank you for saving our marriage very early on. But before there was um, this Dave Ramsey guy, um, there was Ron Blue. Diligently, faithfully, methodically helping Christians learn how to be better stewards with their resources. And he's helped literally thousands of people. So please join me in welcoming Ron Blue. Thank you, Mike. You know, we had uh, five children. Uh, we had three girls and I became a Christian. We had two boys. And that's just a fact. I don't know that there's any cause and effect, but um, I will never forget driving from Atlanta to uh, Denver for a family vacation. We had five kids, and they were probably all below the age of 12. There were, if there had been car seats, we'd have had one. There's no way you could have had five kids with five car seats in a station wagon with kids climbing all over, no, not strapped in or anything. So brought back memories, Mike. I asked Mike what my job was tonight, and he said, well, you're the principal speaker, so I'm a money guy, and I looked up the word principal, and that's what's left when all the interest is gone. <laughs> so I'll cut it short, and we can have some questions, and we'll see where it goes from there. I'm uh, at a stage of life that is really good. Uh, I'm 72. I've been uh, in the financial services world for almost 50 years. I've seen a lot in uh, 50 years, as you can imagine. Um, two years ago, I had uh, open heart surgery, and that was a renewal of life. It was kind of an unexpected thing. Um, and uh, I'm just I, all I'm saying is, if if you want to feel really good, have some open heart surgery because it opens up everything, and you feel good. You, you done that? But I am reminded of a story of old people down in Florida and the retirement community and uh, every night at dinner they would sit around the same table, round table, and uh, one night this uh, elderly gentleman got up his nerve and he looked across the table and said to the elderly lady, he said, would you marry me? And she said right away, she said, oh yes, yes, I would be delighted to marry you. And he said, great, they went on, they had their dessert and went back to their respective rooms. And the next morning when he woke up, he couldn't remember what she said. <laughs> so he called her and he said, do you remember me asking you if you would marry me last night? She said, oh yes, I did. He said, well, what did you say? She said, well, I said, oh yes, yes, I would be delighted to. And thanks for calling because I couldn't remember who asked. <laughs> I have been around a while. Uh, I've been in the, as I say, in the financial services world. I started on Wall Street uh, with, uh, at that time, the world's largest CPA firm, Pete Marwick Mitchell, and then I had my own CPA firm in Indianapolis, and 
then went into full-time ministry for a couple of years and then started a financial planning firm in 1979 uh, that uh, uh, has grown and grown and grown, and today that that firm is the largest fee-only financial planning firm in the country. I've been, uh, I retired 11 years ago in order to uh, work with financial advisors and teach and train them what I had done over uh, my career in that 25 years. And so I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of experiences. And as I've thought back over it, uh, Judy and I were talking the other day about the types of people that I've talked to. You know, I've talked to young, I've talked to old, I've talked to those in debt, I've talked to billionaires. Uh, I've talked to widows, I've talked to divorce, I've, I've talked to all kinds of people over time. Uh, answered thousands and thousands of uh, questions. Uh, and I've had this time now to kind of sit back the last three or four years and do some reflection. Uh, the Lord with that open heart surgery took me out of the game for a while. Uh, and he, at the same time, he... Uh, uh, established a relationship with Indiana Wesleyan University uh, where they set up the Ron Blue Institute for Financial Planning. And so I've had a chance to kind of think back. And even within the last two weeks, I've uh, met with uh, publishers and talked about how could I summarize what God has shown me over the years. And I want to share a couple of things, and then I want to share my passion with you. I was talking to my wife tonight on the phone, and she referred me to Proverbs chapter 8. I want to read it because it summarizes uh, 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 where I am, if you will, what I have learned. It's Proverbs 8, uh, beginning in verse 11. It says, For wisdom is better than precious stones, and nothing desirable can compare to it. I, wisdom, share a home with shrewdness and have knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate arrogant pride, evil conduct, and perverse speech. I possess good, fight, good advice and competence. I have understanding and strength. It is by me that kings reign and rulers enact just law. By me princes lead, as do nobles, and all righteous judges. I love those who love me, and those who search for me find me. With me are riches and honor, lasting wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than solid gold and my harvest than pure silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, giving wealth as an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. It's a phenomenal promises for wisdom. Uh, I testified before Congressional Subcommittee 20 years or so ago. Senator Dodd from Kentucky was, or from Connecticut was the questioner, and he said, what would you tell the American family about finances? And I thought, when I tell him what I'm going to tell him, he's going to laugh. Because the only thing I knew to tell him was some biblical wisdom. So I said, I would tell the American family, Senator, to spend less than they earn, avoid the use of debt, save or build liquidity or margin into their financial situation, and set long-term goals so that they can prioritize their spending between the short term and the long term. And I looked up and he picked up his pencil and he wrote them down and repeated them back to me. And he said, well, it seems to me that that'd work at any income level. <laughs> and I said, you're right, Senator, including the United States government. <laughs> now, that was four biblical principles of financial management. I would add a fifth, and that was to give generously in terms of a principle to follow in terms of managing money. Well, now that's not real hard. There's just five things to remember there, and I would add a sixth even, and that is to understand that God owns it all. That's biblical wisdom, and biblical wisdom is timeless. My passion today is that to communicate and to help others understand that God's Word is authoritative and timeless and transcendent when it comes to all financial planning and all financial decision making because it gives wisdom for the process and principles for the decisions leading to contentment. God's Word is authoritative it speaks to every financial situation that anybody will have. Now, God's Word speaks to people, but it's always uniquely applied. 
So you can't just make up a rule and say everybody has to follow this rule. It doesn't work that way. God says without faith it's impossible to please him, so he's always building my faith. And what he wants is to me to look at his word, to search out the wisdom, and make the decision. But his wisdom will guide those decisions. It's authoritative. I've, I've been on Wall Street. I started on Wall Street. I've been on Wall Street. And I can tell you what. Any good advice coming out of Wall Street, and there's good advice coming out of Wall Street, will find itself in a biblical wisdom principle. I had a, we've got a, a fellow that we work with, with Merrill Lynch, who works on Wall Street. He spent years walking the halls of Merrill Lynch, praying for, the, for Merrill Lynch. And uh, he works, he's a relatively young guy, of course everybody is, but... <clears throat> But he, uh, he went through the training that we do with uh, the organization I started 11 years ago called Kingdom Advisors. And, and he said, you know, he said, I really resented going through that training because I had to pay $1,500 to go through the training. And he said, Merrill Lynch gives us world-class training. They don't charge us anything. But I felt in obedience I should go through it. So he went through it, and he, and he called me afterwards. And this is what he said. Now, this is one of the top advisors in the country, working with the, the most wealthy people in the country and the most significant advisors in the country. He said, I found that my advice didn't change, but now I knew the source. He was a believer who was in God's Word. He didn't tie his advice and biblical wisdom, and our training helped him tie those two together. But the point was, God's Word works at all levels of finance. You know, I could quit right there and say, it works. Trust it. Believe it. He is very, very faithful. Uh, I've been in this business, as I say, for quite a while, and uh, I've begun to get telephone calls from uh, about or from clients that I had 35 years ago. And many of them are passing away, and some of them have long been in retirement. I got a call, one of the most significant calls that I got was from a widow. Who's, uh, who I met with her and her husband. Uh, they lived in Sacramento. He was the CEO of a large uh, grocery chain. And I'll never forget meeting with them. Uh, and when I went to their place, they lived in a, I call it a mobile home park, but it was a little upscale from what you would think of as a mobile home park. And um, when I met with them and looked at their finances, I said to them, and she reminded me, that I said, I think you can give away a million dollars over some time frame. And she said to me, she said, that absolutely stunned us. But I want to tell you that over the last 30 years, we've given away multi-millions. Because they planned to do it, they made the decision uh, to do it. And I thought, I thought there's, there's three characteristics that I have seen in people uh, that have, I'll call it, financial security. And the three characteristics are this, contentment, confidence, and communication. Let me kind of build on that uh, for a second. If I have the right perspective on economies and on wealth, which the Bible gives me, I will experience contentment. Paul said, I've learned to be content. And Jesus, or uh, Paul said in uh, Hebrews, or we say Paul, maybe not, not Paul, whoever wrote Hebrews, those of you that are theologians. Um, Hebrews 13, verse 5 says this, Your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. If I really believe that, I really believe that. I am content in all situations because he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 8, he says, I will always provide all that you need. Because the greatest barriers, I think, to financial freedom and financial security, this, this is not an all-inclusive uh, list, but what I've experienced over time is that people are generally fearful they're fearful of the unknown. Uh, it could be health. It could be economy. It could be the economy. It could be family needs. It could be the loss of a job. It could be many things that cause people 
legitimately to have fear. So I'm not criticizing people. I'm saying there, there's reason to have fear, and it's kind of, uh, it's kind of built in. And uh, another reason to be fearful is 80% of women will experience widowhood. And the average age of the widow is 55. So, men, if your wife is approaching age 55, you're in big trouble. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons to have fear. There's a lot of reasons to be confused. You know, I, I, as you watch television, for example, I watch a lot of sports, and it seems to me that all of the sports are accompanied by multitudinous financial services advertising. You know, so who's right? What product is it? What service is it? Who, who can really deliver peace of mind or peace of heart? Uh, there's doubt. What's the right decisions to make? And another biggie is spousal disagreement. I find that we know that 50% of all marriages that end in divorce cite money uh, as the reason. Now, I, I know this, that my wife thinks differently than I do. And I've got a little story about that. There was a French teacher who was teaching uh, French to English to, to English people, and she said that all nouns in, Fran in French are either feminine or masculine. So one of the students raised his hand. He said, well, what gender is computer? And the teacher looked and couldn't find the answer to what gender it was, so she divided the class into men and women, and she gave him 30 minutes. She said, you come back and tell me whether the gender should be feminine or masculine. So the men's group came back first, and they decided that computers should definitely be of the feminine gender. La computer. Because, four reasons. Number one, no one but their creator understands their internal logic. <laughs> Two, the native language they use to communicate with other computers is incomprehensible to the rest of us. Three, even the smallest mistakes are stored in long-term memory for possible later retrieval. <laughs> and four, as soon as you make a commitment to one, you find yourself spending half your paycheck on accessories. <laughs> the women's group, however, concluded that computers should be masculine, like computer, because in order to get their attention, you have to turn them on. <laughs> Two, they have a lot of data, but they're still clueless. Three, they're supposed to help you solve problems, but half the time they are the problem. <laughs> and four, as soon as you commit to one, you realize that if you'd waited a little longer, you could have gotten a better model. <laughs> Dr. Howard Hendricks, who was uh, really a mentor to me, said that God did not give you a spouse to frustrate you, but to complete you. But the reality is that when it comes to money and money management, very few couples find it really comfortable to communicate because you put two people in one checkbook and you've got different values, different goals, different priorities, different personalities, different training, different experiences. And I think that's God's intention, and especially in the money area, to make a husband and wife communicate. Uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity, it is not a problem. And believe me, I understand the difficulty in husband and wife communication, my wife says, don't ever put me on a spreadsheet. She, and uh, she won't, but the thing that's frustrating is that she makes her financial decisions intuitively, and they're right. You can't make a financial decision intuitively and have it be right, but she does. Well, here's what has to happen, I think, in, to, to drive number one, contentment, but number two, confidence. And number three, communication. I think those are the three things that we're looking for. Contentment, confidence in our financial decisions, and the ability to communicate reasonably and well with our spouses, with our children, with our advisors, with other people. How do we do that? How do we communicate well without it becoming a conflict or a battle? So I think you have to answer two questions and you have to make one decision. I was... Uh, uh, counseling or consulting with a, a fellow from Indianapolis. He was a heart surgeon, and he, he called me, and this was back in about 1980-81. And his question to me was, is it okay for a Christian to live in a million-dollar home? Good question. 
And we were sitting in his living room, and to tell you the truth, it was a home that I lusted after. It was really nice. He had built it, uh, and then he was feeling guilty. So I was giving him some financial advice, and he said, is it okay for a Christian to live in a million-dollar home? And God gave me some wisdom at that particular point. And I said, uh, well, how much time are you spending asking God that question? And he said, well, I don't have a lot of time. You know, I said, I'm in surgery typically by 6 in the morning. I may have call at night and uh, be home late. So I said, well, what are you doing at 4 in the morning? He said, well, generally sleeping. And I said, well, then you don't have anything better to do. Why don't you get up and spend 10 minutes having a quiet time and asking God the, that question. And he started. Uh, he was a very, very successful man, and he was spiritual, but he, was, um, he wasn't necessarily fully 100% committed. Well, he started, and uh, we were on vacation with him uh, later that summer, uh, and his wife said, he's spending two hours a day reading God's Word. And you know what? He never asked me that question again. And he sold the home uh, about five or six months ago. God used that home as an evangelistic outreach. This guy's on multiple boards of directors. He's an evangelical leader in America. Because he had, he had to ask the right question. And the right question when it comes to financial planning, what would God have me do? That's the right question. It's not a question of what the advisor says or what television says. And I can find out typically what God would have me to do by looking at Scripture. So I would say the first two questions, question number one is who owns it? And if you think about it, when you ask that question, who owns it, if you answer the question, well, God owns it, there's a lot of implications to that. And one of the implications is that I hold everything with an open hand. Because it's his. He can put in what he wants to put in. He can take out what he wants to take out. Because I lose my financial freedom when I go like this. Now it owns me. When I hold it like this, God owns it. And it's up to him to put in what he wants to put in and take out what he wants to take out. Now think about this. The implication of that is God's always in control. So when the stock market crashes, when the hurricanes of life comes... It's okay, because I can't lose something I don't own. That's big. When you say God owns it all, then he can take whatever he wants whenever he wants, because it's his. That gives you freedom. It really does give you freedom, because the ultimate conclusion of that is he will meet my needs. And that's what Scripture says. It says it in, uh, in Hebrews 13.5 that I just read. It says in 2 Corinthians 9, uh, 6 through 8, All fear is gone when I don't own anything. Now, I've got to tell you that that's, a pretty, that's not a question that's answered once and for all. That's a question in my life that is being answered on almost a daily basis because I want to take it back. I want to be in control. But, but I, when then I come back and I say, No, wait a minute. He owns it. So if I, if I deal with that question of who owns it, it changes everything. Let me share a funny story with you uh, to kind of make that point. This is Sherlock Holmes on a camping trip. It says, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went on a camping trip, and after a good meal and a bottle of red wine, they lay down for the night and went to sleep. Some hours later, Holmes woke up, nudged his faithful friend, and said, Watson, I want you to look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson said, well, I see millions and millions of stars. Sherlock said, as a good detective, and what does that tell you? After a minute or so of pondering, Watson said, well, astronomically, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce, deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three in the morning. And theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect we'll have a beautiful day tomorrow or today. What's it tell you, Sherlock? Holmes was silent for about 30 seconds, and he said, Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> now, here's the point. 
they were both looking at the same thing, but they had a different perspective. And so when my perspective is that God owns it all, it changes everything about what I see and what I hear and what I take in. That's why that question is so dramatically important because behavior always follows belief. And I would challenge you to read 1 Chronicles 29, 11 to 12. Any of you that have been through a crown Bible study would have memorized that one. But it says God is the owner of everything. It's the answer to the fear question. When you answer the question, God owns it. And I want to tell you again, it's not a once and for all decision. It is an ongoing challenge of faith, challenge to your faith. The second question is, how much is enough? What's the finish line? Because if you don't know what the finish line is, you'll never know when you've arrived. And in America, how much is enough is always just a little bit more. You know, it was interesting. Uh, I used to, I traveled to Africa a lot uh, with Campus Crusade in the late 70s. And I was in, Ni uh, had gone to Nairobi, and there were several of us that took a trip outside Nairobi. We were about four hours outside Nairobi, and we were sitting on a hill uh, at an African pastor's home and looking down at his mud hut with a thatch roof. He had five children, lived in this one room mud hut. And he and his family was kind of the picture of contentment, uh, which was really interesting to me. Uh, and I asked him the question, I said, what's the greatest barrier to the spread of the gospel in this part of the world? And I would have expected the answer to be uh, money or communication or transportation or tribalism or something like that. But what he said was the greatest barrier to the spread of the gospel in this part of the world is materialism. <laughs> I said, what do you mean materialism? He said, if a man has a mud hut, he wants a stone hut. He has a thatch roof, he wants a tin roof. He's got one acre, he wants two acres. He's got one cow, he wants two cows. The answer to the question of how much is enough is really important at any income level. We somehow have the idea that if I have more, I'll have enough. And I want to tell you what, you can, I, this is from my experience, you'll have to take it on the basis of faith. You can never accumulate enough to feel significant or successful or secure, which most of us are after, significant success or security. You cannot accumulate enough money to feel those things. And I say that on the basis of having visited with a lot of billionaires and say, do you feel rich? And the answer is always no. You can't feel rich. You can only believe rich, but you can't feel it. No amount of money will make you feel what you think you will feel. As a matter of fact, the more that you have, the more choices you have, and therefore the greater the complexity of life, and the more confusion there is. So the more you have, the more confusion there is, not the more freedom that there is. Yes, you can make decisions differently, but the more, more and more and more will never ever satisfy the significance, the success, or the security. When Judy and I got married, we lived in a, a 28 foot long trailer that was eight feet wide, six feet tall. You could sit on the pot, do the ironing and cook dinner without moving. When Judy did the ironing, I had to either get out of the trailer or go to the back bedroom of the trailer because the ironing room or the ironing board and me could not fit in the living room. Well, and we, and we didn't have a lot of choices to make. We didn't have to decide where we were going to eat. If there was food in the pantry, we were going to eat that. We didn't have to decide how much money to put away in a 401k. We didn't have to decide how much money we were going to spend for college. We didn't have to decide where to invest money. We didn't have to decide what kind of car we were going to buy, what kind of clothes we were going to buy. We didn't have to decide any of those things. Well, you know, many, many, almost 50 years later, five kids, 13 grandkids, multiple college educations and cars and investments and homes and so forth. I enjoy life, but it's not less confusing because I have more. If anything, it takes me a lot more time to manage it. I'm not saying it's wrong to have at all, but I'm, all what I am saying is that it is not the satisfaction of everything that you think, that there's not a finish line that says, once I get there, I'm gonna be okay, because you won't, because it's not a matter of money, it's always a matter of a belief system. It's also a matter of wisdom. 
Um, I was, was thinking back, again, my wife and I were talking uh, on something over the weekend, and uh, you, you all remember Enron. She was reading something about Enron, and when Enron folded, uh, there was $6 billion of market uh, value that was lost and $2 billion uh, in pension funds that was lost. Uh, it was $8 billion was lost. And uh, we, we have, uh, my old company, we had an office in Houston. We had a lot of Enron executives as clients. And uh, we had to make a decision. In the, this was in the 90s, and Enron stock was going like that. And everybody was reinvesting in Enron stock, and so our counsel was, look, it's going up, but I want to tell you what, the Bible would say diversify your portfolio. You're going to go against conventional wisdom, you're going to look foolish, but that's what the Bible would say. And you know what happened to Enron, and the, the executives that we worked with were very fortunate because they did it. It went against, it was biblical wisdom that went against the conventional wisdom. I had another client who heard me give a talk on how much is enough, and uh, we were on a cruise, um, and he said, I'm going to go home and sell my company. And I said, really, why? He said, well, I've got more than enough. He said, my company's worth $30 million. I'm going to go home and sell it. I said, well, let's talk about that before you do it. So I spent about two years working with uh, this couple, and I said, what are you going to do if you sell your company? He said, well, I'm going to go to work for a ministry. Well, he was a contractor-type entrepreneur, and I said, you could ruin a lot of good ministries. <laughs> and uh, he was in the, the demolition business, uh, big demolition. And so this was in Southern California, and the economy in Southern California was on an upward uh, trend. And uh, I told him, I said, uh, two things. Number one, set, why don't you and your wife set a giving goal? And they did. They set a giving goal of a billion dollars. They said, God's given you the gift of making money. Why don't you use that gift to give? In other words, earn to give. You don't have to earn to live. You've got all that you need there. Why don't you set a giving goal? They set a giving goal of a billion dollars. And um, I also said, because you're generating so much cash flow out of your business, why don't you pay off all that equipment debt? Now, that goes totally against business sense, if you will. You want to leverage up. But he followed the biblical wisdom, just like the Enron executives did. He paid off all of his debt in the late 80s, and in 1991, the California economy collapsed. He was the only survivor in that business west of the Mississippi. He bought out every competitor for pennies on the dollar. And I was in his home. He had no competitors. I was in his home the night of the San Francisco earthquake uh, at the World Series. His equipment was what showed up to take down those bridges and, and do all of the demolition work. A few years later, uh, and he made a lot of money. A few years later, there was a quake in Los Angeles. And I said, you know what? God just sends an earthquake every time he needs some more money. <laughs> Well, here's what happened. He eventually sold his company for $160 million, I think. And he put $100 million into the National Christian Foundation. This was in 91, or this was 92, 93, something like that. Well, we had uh, one part-time employee when he did that. But he said, you can have the $100 million, and you can take all of the earnings off of that and build your infrastructure for this foundation. Well, this is 20 years later. Randy, how much money has NCF given? Six billion? Yeah, five billion out. This guy is the guy that really started financially the National Christian Foundation. And he's seen through that through other people's contributions, $5 billion going out. And he'd set that goal, and he went against conventional wisdom. That's why I say God's ways are not our ways. And if you listen to what he has to say, he has a lot to say about your attitude towards money. And you can make decisions differently when you're listening to what he has to, has to say. If you're dependent upon money, you're never going to have enough. If you're dependent upon God, you always have enough. You will never, ever not have enough. The one decision then that I would suggest, Matthew 6, 19 to 24, 
Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you want to break the power of money, you've got to give. You go like this, and that breaks the power of money. God doesn't need the money. He's not interested in the money. He's interested in our hearts. And he uses money as a tool to get to my heart and as a test to get to my heart. So I've been in this business almost 50 years. Those are just, those are the big rocks of what I've learned. I think uh, I've gone, I've already told you more than I know, so let's have some questions. <laughs> if we've got any. Okay. There are two gentlemen with microphones. Uh, just mm -hmm. when, when you speak into it, really get it close to your mouth. It looks like you're eating in a microphone, but it's the only way we'll be able to hear you. So just raise your hand. And ask any question. My kids say, Dad, you may not understand them, but you can explain it. So ask a question. <laughs> Anybody? You gonna let me off? Um, I, my wife and I have been truly blessed financially, and that doesn't mean we're wealthier necessarily in terms of money, but we are very, in our, as we retire, uh, we're comfortable. But, um, and so I thank God for everything we have. I, but I think of the uh, verse where the young man came to Jesus and said, uh, what else do I need to do? Because he's been obedient and he follows the Ten Commandments. And then Jesus said, sell everything you have in your possessions and follow me. And, of course, he walks away sad because that was real tough to do because that was real hard for anybody, I guess, sure. to think of that. But I think that continues to kind of haunt me, for lack of a better way of saying that, is, um, you know, in, in the, you've been you've been good in terms of how you communicate that God owns it, but I'm still struggling with how do you come to a decision as to what you part with, and yet still provide security for your family, for your wife, if I predecease her, etc. I don't know if that makes sense. So oh yeah, it makes absolute sense because I think what and it's really uh, it's a great question to wrestle with, and not very many people will have the courage to wrestle with it because it's a significant uh, decision. And, and what I found in, in terms of biblical principles and wisdom uh, is that uh, God doesn't set up rules. He sets up principles. So, you know, if God said, uh, give everything away at age 65, we would give away at age 65. If he said the, the, the Christian lifestyle is 37.5% of adjusted gross income, we would spend 37 and a half percent we would follow the rules because what he wants to do is to build my faith so even in this decision it's not about the money it's about your faith and what you have is you've got multiple principles and here's a principle also it says in first timothy that a man is worse than an infidel that doesn't provide for his family and you've got the rich young ruler so which one governs? And I think that what he does is he wants to drive me to my knees to answer that question. And I'm always cautious about, um, uh, I won't say extreme positions because uh, I've seen a lot of extreme positions work out, but, um, but I, would, I would say if you're sincerely looking for the answer to that question, God will give it to you, but don't forget that providing for your family is as strong a principle. And the, the rich young ruler, to me, was a, was a story, was an illustration, and he was illustrating something, that providing for your family is much more of a principle uh, to follow. Um, and I, I'm 72 years old, and I wrestle with that question, too. Um, how much should I accumulate for retirement, and how do I provide for my family? And it's a constant tension but I, I would be really cautious about ever, if somebody ever, not making sure that their heirs, their spouse was taken care of. So I'm not, I wouldn't give you an answer except to drive you back to God will give you the answer, and He will. And don't be anxious, and don't be, um, don't be anxious to make that decision either. Let Him show you. He will. You bet. Over the, last four, over the last 40 years, how, in your business and communicating with people, how have you seen the characteristics of people change, if at all? 
are we, uh, is it uh, more involved, easier, harder, just as you see, look at the spectrum. Well, I think, um, you know, I was born in 1942, uh, right after Pearl Harbor. Um, and then if I, if I follow my life, uh, I've lived through an awful lot of economic ups and downs and wars and recessions and so forth and so on. And here's, but yet, 40% of the world's wealth is in America, and 2.5% of the world's population is in America. What I have observed is that people are much more cognizant of the fact that wealth is not the answer. Materialism is not the answer. And I think that that's a good thing. I think that people are, are looking around and, you know, if, if wealth were the answer, professional athletes would be the happiest people on earth. Uh, and we don't see that. Uh, and we see unbelievable amounts of money paid for entertainment. And we don't, and yet you see divorces, you see money is not the answer. So my observation in my life is that people have, have looked and said money or wealth is not the answer. And therefore, I think we have a window of opportunity as believers to tell them what the answer is. Uh, you talked about conflicts in uh, relationships with your spouse, and uh, my wife Pearl and I have been married 59 years. Oh, great. And, uh, Congratulations. Was it? <laughs> It's been a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> At times. But uh, just a reminder for those of you who haven't been married that long, when we were, when we were first married, the uh, pastor said that the two will become one flesh, and now after 59 years, the two will become one brain. <laughs> <laughs> I've always found that the problem is deciding which one flesh you're going to become. <laughs> so anyway, what... A, a, my other comment was I wanted to talk about the parable of the talents. Um, and, you know, we, it says in there one was given ten, one was given five, and one was given one. And it tells you how many talents were returned to the master, but it didn't really say how many were earned by these people. But I can tell you the poor guy that buried his got nothing. And so when you're given talents, use them, enjoy them, return to God. Yep. Here's a question on that, which I find really intriguing, is why did the master give the one talent to the one who had ten? It said, you know, he said they're both well done, good and faithful servants. You've been faithful with a few things. Why did he give it to the one with the ten? Good question. It is a good <laughs> question. I, I think the answer is it was his talent. He can do with it what he wants to do. Okay. Hey, Randy. Hey, Ron. Can you talk a bit about family legacy? What have you intentionally done to pass on the wisdom that you've picked up in 72 years to your kids and your grandkids? Well, it really needs to start early. Um, probably the biggest thing that happened in, in our uh, family and family legacy, our kids would not even have been aware of, and that was when Judy and I decided... Uh, that we were not, it's a, kind of a long story, but we had the opportunity to go back to Indianapolis and take over the CPA firm that I had started. And when we went through the thinking of it and decision of it, we said, you know, if we go back, what's likely to happen is we're going to get into the same lifestyle we came out of when we went into ministry, and that was a materialistic lifestyle. And we said, if we do... With five kids, we're likely to lose one or more to that materialism. Um, so we made the decision to start the financial planning practice as opposed to going back to something that was secure because of our kids. Uh, and I also made a commitment uh, as a lot of, you know, I, I built a business. I've built several businesses, but the financial planning firm that I built, you know, is a, it's a big firm. And... Uh, but I made a commitment that I would, would never bring work home at night, and I would never work on weekends. And when I traveled, I always had rules on when I would travel. So if I was gone 
uh, on a weekend speaking or something than I didn't travel the week before or the week after. And I was always home for dinner and home for breakfast. These were kind of rules that we set up. And uh, Judy's 70th birthday was this last week. And uh, the kids, uh, the five kids, uh, each of them filled out 14 reasons why they appreciated their mother, uh, uh, which made 70. Five times the 14 was 70. And it was really fascinating because some of the things... The dinner table was really important. We never left the dinner table until our kids left, the last kid left. We laughed a lot. They saw generosity. We entertained missionaries. So we didn't follow rules as much as we tried to live a life. And God honored that. Uh, the five kids are all doing well. They're all uh, married well and uh, raising their kids. You know, they don't raise their kids like we did. They, and anybody here that has adult children knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and they don't ask your advice <laughs> about those kids. So it was more a lifestyle, Randy, than it was... Um, well, I, I did things with my kids. Uh, I, took, uh, I always took uh, the oldest one out for uh, breakfast every week when they were in school. And then when they would leave and the next one would get that. And I took them on trips and... So it was a lifestyle over many, many years, and they've, they've done very well. So it's, it's kind of late to start when they're gone. And uh, Yeah, they are. And uh, they're aware that, you know what, you're all doing fine. We're going to give it all away. Very well. Very well. Um, and I've seen, I haven't seen wealth transferred well. You know, I interviewed David Green, the founder of Hobby Lobby, several weeks ago. Uh, I don't even remember the question I asked him, but the, uh, the answer he gave, I remember. And he said, he re he said we, we realized several years ago that we were creating something that was going to have immense value, billions of dollars of value. And he said, so my wife and I had to answer the question, ask and answer the question, um, if we have 20 heirs, children and grandchildren, and we've done a phenomenal job of raising these kids and, and they've raised their kids, and 19 of them can handle the wealth, but it would ruin one, they said it wasn't worth it. He said it wasn't worth it. So he's given everything. He said, if we sell Hobby Lobby, we don't get a penny because we've decided we do not want our kids to have to, um, we, we don't want to take the chance of ruining a kid. Now, I'm sure they're taking care of their kids when they're growing up and so forth. But it's a really tough thing. You know, I teach a lot on, I, I, I say this with kids, if you love your children equally, you'll treat them uniquely because they're unique individuals. That's in that book, Splitting Errors, if you want to buy it. Acton makes all the money on that. I don't make any money. <laughs> huh? You, <laughs> the agent makes all the money. That's right. But I, I know many of you are affiliated with NCF, but that is a phenomenal success story. Um, Larry Burkett and uh, Terry Parker and myself were the founders of it, but it didn't get started until that donor put that $100 million in there, and uh, Terry went full-time and has really built that thing. Uh, significantly. Great, great tool. In the back. Could you expand a little bit more on what you just said, treat them uniquely? <laughs> I, I use the phrase, fair isn't equal and equal isn't fair. But I could use a little, uh, a little more on that. Well, I'll give you the example. It took, um, you know, I wrote the book Splitting Errors because Judy and I were going through the estate planning process and I'd worked a lot with clients, so we were applying it ourselves. And the, the, first, the first thing we did was ask ourselves the question, if we left whatever it is, say a million dollars, to this particular child, what's the worst thing that could happen? And we had five different answers with five different children. Uh, in one case, it was we'd give it all away. 
We said, well, how serious is that? The answer was not very serious. So uh, the third question was, well, how likely is that to occur? And the answer was probably 100% because he has a real giving heart. We had a, uh, we had a, one of our daughters married a man who grew up in a 600 square foot home in Moody, Alabama. He was, they met at the University of uh, Auburn. And his intense need was to provide for his family. His dad had drilled that into him. It's your responsibility to provide for your family. So we ask ourselves the question, well, what's the worst thing that could happen if we left a million dollars to them? And the answer was, we would take away his opportunity to provide for his family. We said, how serious is that? That's really serious. That's a real significant uh, consequence. And we said, how likely is that to occur? And the answer was probably 100%. Well, that was almost 20 years ago, and today things have changed. And incidentally, all of this estate planning changes over time. Your kids change, the marriages change, the, the grandkids change. It's, a, it's not something that is set in stone and is forever, I don't believe. We've seen so many changes. And now our kids, the oldest is 47, the youngest is 36, they've pretty well made it. And so it's not like we need to provide for them anymore. But while we were doing this, we had a, our third daughter went through a divorce and she was a single mom for six years. Um, and we were providing for her a lot. But she, when we said, what are her needs? Her needs were significant compared to her siblings. So we said, well, she's our number one priority when it comes to uh, whatever happens with wealth. Um, and, and it was an agonizing decision, but her needs were unique. And we've, we've taught our kids all along that we love you equally, but we are not going to give, if we give $100, my wife gives away a lot of money, we're, doesn't mean we're gonna give it to the other four. So one son-in-law lost a job. We provided, we lost a job. We didn't feel any obligation whatsoever to equal that out with the other kids. That's kind of what I mean. It's, um, I think it's a great principle. Now, most people, when they go through that process, will end up ending with equal, but they think about it a lot differently. Boy, that shut it down. <laughs> how, how important is it to include your kids or inform your kids of of what is in the trust and how they would benefit, not benefit, or what, what the thinking is behind that. i tell you what we have found, and I, this is our personal situation, is we've not shared dollars with them because it's changed. Um, when they were younger, um, we were leaving quite a bit of money to them. But as they've gotten older, we've realized that the money that we leave, I mean, you know, when your kids are in their 50s, They've made their life, and so the money ends up in the third generation. And we're uncomfortable with the money ending up in the third generation. Uh, we've wanted to provide for our kids, but we have not wanted to make our grandchildren wealthy. So we've, we've not shared with them dollars. We've shared with them that we have a giving heart, and we want to provide for them, but our goal is that all the money is allocated to the kingdom one way or the other. And, and it's a lot of people will share the specifics. Uh, and I don't, I've sat in those conversations and they're okay, especially when they're in concrete. But our, the way we've worked it out is we've decided we're not gonna tell them specifics because the specifics change in our case. Randy? You've done some great work with Kingdom Advisors. What would you suggest the considerations be when selecting advisors? <laughs> Was that the question I gave you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel pretty strongly that uh, advisors should share your value system. If they don't understand where you're coming from, they can't ask you the right questions. And if they don't ask you the right question, you can never get the right answer. Um, so we're, we're, I've spent the last 11 years training uh, Christian advisors to integrate biblical wisdom into their advice and counsel. 
And God has really honored that. We've got 1,500 advisors around the country, and we're getting ready, I think, to really explode uh, with the opportunities that the Lord has brought. So my counsel would be to certainly uh, uh, interview an advisor before you hire them and find out where they stand spiritually. Doesn't mean because they're a Christian they give good advice. Not even saying that. You want, you want a believer who has some wisdom with them. You know, I, I have a, <laughs> I had a friend. He was an Air Force colonel. He was a caustic guy. And he said, you know, if you were stupid before you became a Christian, you become a Christian, you're a stupid Christian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so being a Christian does not mean that you give good financial advice. So don't, don't hire an advisor just because they're a believer, but t- test them. And there are some good ones. And over there's one. <laughs> Kevin. That's Kevin Cusack. Okay? Cusack. C U S A K. <laughs> are we done? Or do we still I'm, have time for a few more questions? Okay, very good. I'm I I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> I spent an hour with Dave last week, incidentally, so, and Dave's a friend of mine. Um, I think the big difference is that um, what God has shown me over the years is that financial advice should begin with a biblical worldview. So all that I've done uh, over time has been to take what God's Word says and try to make it work in the advice area so it's a and it's never prescriptive um, because I don't think God's word is prescriptive he he wants me or you to um, uh, operate in on a faith basis I think Dave's advice is very prescriptive and that's not wrong but it's that's the way that uh, that where he comes from and it kind of tacks the Bible on as opposed to begin with a biblical worldview. And again, I don't criticize that. Dave's got a real evangelistic heart, um, and he gives good advice for the most part. But, but I have trouble with black and white advice because I, I find that it's not always black and white. Um, for example, our approach on debt would be a little different. I don't discount what he says. Um, but I think that there are some principles that govern debt, and um, and I don't believe debt is wrong. I believe in many cases it's stupid, but it's not wrong. It's not a sin to be in debt. It's just foolish. But there are instances on debt um, that I've seen that um, are necessary. I've seen an awful lot of people with illnesses, unexpected loss of jobs, um, things like that where it comes down to a debt situation. I don't believe in debt for funding lifestyle, be it consumer debt or be it even mortgage debt. So um, we would agree on almost everything uh, probably if you sat us in a room like we were uh, a week ago. Uh, but his approach is totally different. He's, and he's much more confrontational than I am. <laughs> he loves it. I mean, he loves to, he loves to be confronted. I, I was on Gary Bauer's board for a while, and one time Gary was going to be interviewed by somebody uh, that was going to try to kill him. And he said, Ronnie, he said, I think I have a character flaw. He said, I love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's just not me. <laughs> so that's Dave's not me. Um, and I think mine is much more uh, what God has taught me is the financial planning and decision making. It's a holistic approach to financial advice. But good question. Last one right here. Ron, many of the people I deal with in, in my work with clients, if they have children, they make kind of an automatic assumption that they will split their wealth evenly with two kids, three kids, four kids, whatever it is. What do you say to someone to plant the seed that 
let's think beyond that and think about some sort of charitable gift, whether it's a percentage, whether it's a particular asset, whatever it might be. What do you say to somebody to really plant that seed and start aggravating their thinking? Well, the best advice is typically the questions you ask. It's not the advice that you give. So what I would would say in a situation like that is, what do you think would happen to if you do this? Do you have any risk of the marriages? Um, what's going to happen with the grandkids? Um, so I would I would ask a lot of questions like that, um, and I probably wouldn't give them one of my books, but. Um, but I have written a book that, if, as an advisor, I would give them that book because it confronts those issues uh, head on, and you don't have to confront them. You can just counsel with them because it asks those questions. Um, I think that the greatest mistake made in the whole wealth transfer area is that people go right immediately to the tools and techniques without answering the questions. And the tools and the techniques are to accomplish the objective. They are not the objective. So a, a tool like that book, uh, Splitting Errors, would be uh, helpful. And I, I would say that. So, OK, thank you.